Reverend Joe LaGuardia, who has been the Reverend of First Baptist Church of Vero Beach since 2016. Yes? Okay. Welcome up, Reverend LaGuardia. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Microphone, so let me get that. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm so thankful for your hospitality, and I'm so glad to be here, and I'm so honored uh, to be a part of your service this evening. Uh, as uh, uh, Cantor Sarah mentioned, we've been friends for a long time, and uh, Rabbi Michael and, Car uh, and uh, Cantor Sarah and I uh, are part of the Interfaith Association. Many of you have been a part of those events, and it's just been such a pleasure. And uh, several months ago, I mentioned to Rabbi Michael that I could speak if he ever goes away or wanted to go on vacation. And you know, he's a, he works extremely hard on behalf of this community and, and our entire community. And uh, you should be very proud of him as, as we are in the community uh, for his, uh, his work. And uh, I offered to speak and I said, you know, if I ever come and speak, I just have one condition. I don't want to speak on the book of numbers. I, 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 I've, uh, I, I love Leviticus. Not many people in, in our tradition really like Leviticus because it's very complicated. I love Leviticus. We can do prophets or something else, but just not numbers. Just don't give me numbers. He said, you know, coincidentally, I'm going to be out of town over the summer, and the passage is Numbers 19 through 22. And I said, well, is there a different day that I could speak? He said, no, that's it. So here I am speaking in the book of Numbers, and I just want to extend uh, the peace and grace to you from the congregation of First Baptist Church of Vero Beach uh, as well. A uh, Jewish scholar calls Numbers a book of miscellany within the Torah, uh, various stories put together through sources and, and uh, various uh, stories strung together as the Israelites sojourn through the wilderness. I like to think of it like a pearl necklace, where you bead these pearls very carefully to make a beautiful tapestry of the various wanderings and sojourning through uh, the wilderness. And Numbers, according to some people, span some 38 years of Israel sojourning through that time. And if you've been traveling in the wilderness for 38 years, I'm sure that you too would become very jaded. Or at least from that length of being in a state of dislocation, uh, probably complaining every now and then, you probably remember long rides with perhaps your parents or your loved ones where you ask over and over again, are we there yet? And it's not too often that our children complain when we're on a long trip. And we find that within that period of dislocation, a feeling homeless, that not only are the God's people jaded in many respects, but they also have selective memories. I don't know if you've ever suffered from selective memories. Uh, <laughs> I have. I usually have a, the wives understand this. I'll, I'll tell you about my, my story. My wife will bring up an issue and I'll say, well, you know, I mean, that's today. You know, yesterday was pretty good. She says, well, what about the day before that? Well, the day before that was just fine. Well, working with people in our own community, I remember uh, working with uh, one caregiver who, uh, who had a lot of trouble with her, the one she was caring for. I worked with caregivers uh, for, for a long time. And uh, she, it was a very um, verbally, uh, I don't want to say abusive relationship, but, but one in which there was, a, there, were a lot of, there was a lot of duress within the situation. And, and she was stressed. But as soon as her loved one went to the hospital, I can't live without him. I love him. I can't live without him. Selective memories. Even, even our own nation has uh, selective memory at times. I've heard so many people within my own congregation, even within our community, don't you remember the good old days? Now, when I get nostalgic, I remember the good old days. But then there are other parts of the good old days that we conveniently forget. Selective memory. Selective memory brings to mind, I think, what is familiar and safe and predictable. And for many of us, that's the space of nostalgia. Perhaps many of you have had a very hard time through this pandemic. Think before the pandemic. And when you think of that, you get nostalgic, it becomes a, a, a memory of safety, of familiarity, and predictability, even if it's not good for us. And I recall so many people who say have been in a situation of duress, and psychologists tell us that we only remember the good parts. 
and only keep the good memories. And we forget about the things that were hard, that were difficult. And that selective memory is a way for us to cope and to survive. One uh, pediatrician author, Harvey Karp, calls it the soggy chip rule. We would rather have soggy chips than no chips at all. And when we have selective memory, we tend to remember that. A pastor a long time ago by the name of Martha Dixon Kearns preached a sermon which she called Sin and Why I Like It. And, and she likened sin to this predictable, habitual way of living in disrepair or dysfunction or a sense of dislocation to the, to the, to the point in which that becomes normal and because of that, we live almost as in an abusive relationship in a place where we think that's normal. And rather than relinquishing uh, ourselves of the sin, according to Reverend uh, Kearns, we rather live into it. We fear letting go of it. And for some of us, we fear letting go of the past. And rather than looking forward to the horizon, we tend to get jaded. And we tend to complain. And many times we fall into selective memory. If you look at the season of your tradition and the text that Rabbi Michael gave us, which is Numbers 19 through 22, verse 1, you'll see that that's where we are in Numbers. And when you look at the pearls on the necklace in this portion of Torah, you find that the people have become jaded. They are standing on the precipice of entering the Promised Land. They can almost see it if they squint their eyes hard enough. They've been traveling long enough. And for some reason, the people around them, the nations around them, like Edom, are not working with them. And things are just not going their way. They're, loved, they're the beloved leaders. They're heroes like Miriam and Aaron are aging. In fact, the story begins with Miriam's death. One of those last links, that last generation, that linked them to the great promises and work of God in Egypt. And here Aaron is feeble. And Moses, the bridge, uh, their younger brother stands with them and, of course, tries to rally them. But this is a time of selective memory, and so the people end up complaining. They're thirsty. And in chapter 20, specifically, they complain of, for water, much like they did long ago in Exodus. And they're hungry, and they actually call manna, which God has provided every day since they left Egypt, Miserable, miserable food. Can you, encourage, can you imagine calling something that God has given you every day, faithfully, miserable? And they want to go back to Egypt. Remember back on the shores of Egypt, where we had bread every day, where we enjoyed our homes, selective memory. In times of trauma, selective me memory acts as a coping mechanism. It, it helps us to survive. But therapists tell us that if we live too long in that selective memory, there will be things that shake us up. And, and many therapists have come up with the idea, or at least are, are uh, hypothesized, that there is such a thing called body memory. It means that though our memories, we may have selective memory, our bodies maintain and retain the truth, the true memories of who we are and of parts of our identity. And if we continue to live within that, those selective memories, there will things that jar us out of that nostalgia to bring about body memories in which our bodies are roused to bring us into a true place in which we see the truth and we see what God has us to see. A traumatologist, a, a friend of mine, she's a theologian and she works in the area of trauma, something that I, I know about. You know, I, many of you remember we had the Parkland, after the Parkland shooting, we were here and I spoke. And I, I told you that I'm a gun victim, uh, gun violence victim. My father was killed in a mass shooting in 2013. My friend was the coach, uh, acquaintance. he was a friend back in high school, I hadn't talked to him, but he was the coach killed as a result of Parkland. And I've learned over the years that that trauma really does affect the body. We have selective memories. It's a way to survive. But there are things that jar us into the present. And uh, Jennifer Baldwin, a friend of mine who deals with theology and trauma, says that our bodies are our first home. And if our minds get too far into our selective memories, our bodies will come alive. 
and remind us of who we are and the things that we have to deal with. And there are things that shake us and there are things that bring us into the present to where we can enter into a place where we dig deep into that body memory where both healing and God's presence exist. Healing and God's presence exist. When we look at the pearls in this part of the necklace of numbers, we see the Lord jarring his people into a deep memory of who he is and who they are. In Numbers 19, there are rituals and laws pertaining to corpses, how to handle lovingly and respectfully those who have passed away, but also how to maintain the hygiene and the correct ritual of being brought to a place to where when one handles a corpse, these are the rituals, the initiation, the routines, and the rhythms that we bring about to heal as a people to maintain purity of the community. And then soon after Numbers 19, you move into Numbers 20, where the people begin to uh, complain about water soon after Miriam herself dies. And you get a sense that the Lord is stirring something deep in their memory as a people. And a lot of scholars look at this and say, well, there are rituals about corpses in 19, and there's complaint in 20. What's the connection? The connection is that the Lord is getting the people in touch with their deepest memories, their body memories, to the point where you move from ritual to the death of Miriam and now to complaint of water. And the Lord stirs Moses and Aaron and gives Moses very specific instructions. He says, gather, the Lord says, take your staff, that old faithful staff that he had so long ago. You remember the staff, turned into a serpent a long time ago. Take your staff, assemble the people, speak to the rock, and before your very eyes, water will come out. And the language is very purposeful in which the Lord evokes all of these bodily memories of taking, assembling, speaking, and looking. But it's at that point that we see that Moses, even Moses is jaded. And he doesn't have the wherewithal to hear the Lord. And as a failure of listening to the exact instructions, of tapping back into his selective memory rather than to the present. Remember the Lord says to speak to the rock, but he taps into his selective memory. And just like long ago in Exodus, Moses instead hits the rock because that's the selective memory from long ago rather than speaking to it. And rather than giving the Lord praise, he gets angry and he lives out that selective memory of dealing with this angry people, perhaps out of his own trauma of being, dis, uh, being in a place of dislocation, have, having to be in charge of such stubborn folks, something I know very much about. <laughs> We're all stubborn. And rather than speaking, he strikes the rock and the Lord as a result, says that he and Aaron will not enter into the promised land. It seems like a harsh consequence, but we have to remember that the Lord is doing something in which he is jarring the people back into the present, and if their leaders fail to be present, fail to listen and to hear, and to enact their own deep memory of who they are and who God is, then how can they expect their people to follow? We move along quickly to Edom. Edom, uh, the kings of Edom don't allow them to pass. They're there, they're not able to pass through the main highway, the thoroughfare to get to the promised land. They're restricted. And there in Numbers 21, they start to complain about food. And God wakes them up and jars deep body memory by sending nothing other than serpents to attack and inflict them. Sometimes in times of my own despair and trauma. There are things that I have engaged in where I feel fully alive. And some people who feel that will jump out of perfectly good planes with parachutes. <laughs> or get a bungee cord or do something crazy. And it's in that moment that people feel fully alive. And I have a feeling that the Lord sent serpents because he jars them into the presence with this stinging bite. And then he tells Moses and Aaron after they want to heal and they they, uh, they turn to the Lord, and the Lord tells Moses 
and Aaron make a pole, put a bronze serpent on it, and whoever looks at it, whoever is present and can feel and come fully alive, snap into the present and look at that pole will be healed. Only to find that that actually happens. And then they go to war, and they're victorious in war. And you find at the end of Numbers 21 that they do something else with their whole body and as a whole congregation, and that is to sing. They're faced with death and despair and dislocation. And as the Lord jars them into the present, digging deep into that memory of God, that body memory, by the end of our lesson for this season, they are a people who remember how to sing. I encourage you to read that at home. Numbers 22, or 21. Old Testament, or Hebrew Testament, uh, Hebrew, sorry, I'm gonna go used to speaking to a, a group of Christians. <laughs> The Hebrew, Hebrew Bible scholar, Walter Brueggemann, says that Israel sings, and we never know what holy power is unleashed by singing. And we did that tonight, and you're used to it, but since I'm not used to it, I was fully present tonight because I'm outside of my own tradition. So when I do the things that you may be used to, that you're used to doing because you've done it your whole life, it jarred me into the presence. We're standing, we're sitting, we're singing, we're reciting, we're listening, we're silent. We have a beautiful voice that brings us into the present and reminds us that we're about repairing the world. But the question today is, where do we need God to jar us into deep memory today? Where do we need to feel fully alive, to be present with the Lord, to initiate healing and to find God's presence? in the midst of our uncertainty, our dislocation, our disorientation, or our unrest. If you're not, if you have selective memory and you think all is well, just turn the news on. And I guarantee you in five minutes your blood pressure will be up and you'll find that place of dislocation. And this is for you. We have to look and we have to see. In uh, my own tradition, there's a wonderful story after Jesus' resurrection and the disciples, uh, Christ's followers are out and they're going to temple to pray. For afternoon prayers, they see a man lame and he's this man who's been lame from birth is there. He has been brought there every day to beg and the disciples pass him by and the lame man says, excuse me, fellas, do you have some change? Just a penny, you know, something for bread. And the disciples say, look at us, look at us. And for the first time in this man's life, he looks up rather than looking down. Seeing eyes are healing eyes. Where do we need to look? Where do we need to listen? Moses and Aaron's failure to listen to the Lord translates to distrust. If you read Numbers 20, the Lord says, you did not trust me. It's not a matter of you not listening. You didn't trust me. Where do you need to listen today? And as a result, to be present and to trust. And most importantly, where do you need to sing today? How do you need to participate in that healing rhythm of singing as God's people where powerful rhythms are unleashed to bring healing and God's presence? Uh, any of you all know uh, Dr. Sal? Do you remember Dr. Broda Sal? He was a doctor locally here. Anybody know that name? Okay. He and his wife, Pat Sal, anyway, Pat Sal, they passed away several years ago, but the last time I visited with Pat Sal was over at the Florida Baptist, Baptist Retirement Center in the memory care unit. We were, uh, I visited her and they were doing this hymn sing, church hymn sing, guest was there. So Pat came out, again, she's in the memory care unit, dementia, she doesn't know who I am and she didn't remember her husband by this time. But when she started singing, she knew every word to every hymn. And not just the first stanza, she knew every stanza. There's something about that deep body memory in which we sing. Where do you need to sing today? And my prayer for you today is that whatever uh, you have going on this week, wherever you get restless or you feel in a place of dislocation, I pray that you'll see, you'll listen, you'll trust. And just as your tradition, as does my tradition, teaches you, that even in the face of steep odds, sing. Amen. Thank you.